Ken, and I'm really pleased to see you join us today as we um, hear God's Word and worship Him together as His people. Um, so, you know, Henry has already said that we'll be continuing our series in Acts, and just as the word in Isaiah um, to God's people was for them to evaluate their lives in the, with the impending judgment of God, so to my prayers for us to evaluate our lives in light of God's word. You know, like, have you ever used a spirit level? Right, a spirit level is kind of like, you know, this little, well, it can be big as well, but like it has this little water bubble thing inside, and then it can show you whether something is like parallel to the ground or not, right? Or not really the ground, but parallel to, yeah. And, and so God's word is like a spirit level for us to see whether our lives is kind of like in line um, with God. And so like my, my prayer is that yeah, as we hear God speak to us, um, that we might uh, compare and evaluate our lives according to His Word so that we might live rightly um, before Him. So please join me in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank You so much for Your Word that You speak to us. Uh, we thank You, Lord, that we are not left um, in the dark um, not knowing who you are, not knowing um, your heart um, for your people. Uh, Father, we thank you that you've revealed yourself to us, and please help us, Lord, to hear your word rightly and receive it um, in submission and obedience to you as our Lord and Savior. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, um, you know, when I first moved out of my parents' home, uh, we got married and then we moved out, and then we moved all these things, right, like all our belongings into the new place. I left some things behind, um, and to my annoyance, my mum would then pack it all up and just drop it off at our place without us knowing, because they had a spare key to our place, right? So, so one day we'll come home, and it's like, oh, it's my stuff. It's just here. And, and so, like, and, and I was pretty young, so I, I wasn't really good at organizing, you know, where to put things in the home. So what I did was, well, Beck and I, what we did was we had a junk room. <laughs> so we just kind of shoved everything in there. And then every now and then you walk into the junk room and then I kind of, kind of find like, whoa, this was from my 21st birthday. Like, you know, like a, a collage of pictures of friends and family and people, um, you know, in my younger years. It's like, wow, this is, this is going way back. And then you just kind of like go through it and you find some random things. Now, it's been over 10 years, right? And I'm still the same. I, have, I still have a junk room. And the junk room is the garage, right? So we've moved houses like twice already, and we still haven't unpacked everything. Just, the garage is the junk room. We just shove things in there. And it is the one room that I'm very, very embarrassed to kind of show people. It is like the no-go zone. It is the, the, like, you know, whenever people come over and they want to do a house tour, I won't show them the garage because <laughs> it's just like too much junk in there. It's just, it's just embarrassing. Um, now, when we think about the gospel, there are no boundaries for the gospel. You know, the gospel, there's no no-go zones, there's no exclusion zones. Now, I want you to discuss this with, your, with the person next to you or people around you. Is there anywhere in the world where you wouldn't go for a holiday? And there's anywhere in the world where you wouldn't go for a holiday, even if I paid for it. All right? Talk to the person next to you and... Explain why you chose that answer. Okay, bring it back. Uh, I, heard, I heard Antarctica. Uh, I heard North Korea. I think for me, but the first thing that comes to mind was probably Ukraine. Like, I don't want to go to a war-torn war zone. Um, yeah. Now, we just prayed for Isabel, uh, Isabel Palmer, right? And, uh, you know, she's sharing the gospel in Japan. And, and I think Japan, 
Well, yeah, that, that's, that's a place where a lot of people would like to holiday. Some people just came back from Japan as well and you know, had lots of fun there. Um, and, and, and again, the gospel has no boundaries, even to the places that you wouldn't want to go. You know, remember, like ages ago, some of you might, might still be little kids when Australia was turning back the boats because the government called these asylum seekers, these refugees, illegal immigrants or queue jumpers. Remember that? I have a picture for you on the, sl- on the slide. This is a picture from Australia's Operation Sovereign Borders. Um, it's a campaign to stop asylum seekers coming to Australia by boat. No way you will not make Australia home. Australia was a no-go zone for asylum seekers on boats. You, we wanted to have sovereignty over our borders, but for the gospel, in today's passage, there are no borders. There are no boundaries because Jesus is the risen King. There is no square inch on this planet where the gospel shouldn't be proclaimed, where the news of the King, Jesus, risen, Lord of all, should not be proclaimed. There is no one whom the gospel is irrelevant. See, we are are resuming our series in the book of Acts And the first seven chapters that we've gone through last year has established that Jesus is indeed the risen King. He is is ascended to heaven. God has accepted His substitutionary sacrifice by raising Jesus from the dead. And then Jesus, as the King, He gives the blueprint for the expansion of His kingdom in chapter 1, verse 8. Speaking to His disciples, He said, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now this means that there are no boundaries for the gospel. And then we also saw the Holy Spirit come upon the apostles powerfully as they preached and proclaimed this news of the risen King. And it resulted in the expansion of the church as a community of people who were committed to hearing the Lord's word, to prayer and love for one another. And then the religious leaders of the time, they began to see this Christian community as a threat to their power and their influence. So they started to threaten these Christians and even persecute them. But the disciples would not remain quiet. They cannot stop preaching because... The gospel has no boundaries. They had to obey God rather than men. They kept proclaiming Jesus, the risen Messiah. And then in chapter 7, at the end of the last series, in chapter 7, the tension reached a boiling point where Stephen was the first to die for his faith in Jesus Christ. Chapter 8, which we've just read, the first half, follows from chapter 7. And in chapter 7, Jesus was clearly proclaimed as the risen Lord. Have a look at verse 55. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open." And the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. He sees heaven open, the clouds part. He sees the Lord Jesus reigning on high. And he proclaims this news. He tells the people what he sees and he was killed for it. Chapter 8, which we are up to, is the result of the truth that Jesus rules. It shows us the implications that Jesus is now enthroned at God's right hand. You see, because of Jesus' death, resurrection, and enthronement, everything that the Jewish religion pointed to, God's presence, God's rule, God's plan with dealing with sin, is now to be found in Jesus Christ, the risen King. So now place is irrelevant. You don't have to go to the temple in Jerusalem to worship God. You don't have to go there to be in God's presence because He dwells in His, pe- in his people by His Spirit. There is now no more special race of God's people 
because Jesus died for all peoples and nations and tribes. Therefore, proclamation, not place, is what matters. Therefore, reception of the news, not race, is what matters. So we see in chapter 8 that there are no boundaries for the gospel and that there are no second-class Christians. There are no second-class citizens in God's kingdom because Jesus is the risen King. So point one, there are no boundaries for the gospel of the risen Lord Jesus. Look at verse 1. Verse 1. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. And then you kind of skip down to verse 4. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks the impure spirits came out of many, And many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in the city. The persecution didn't stop the gospel from going out. It didn't stop its advance. Rather, the result of persecution is that the gospel had invaded Samaria in fulfillment of the risen Christ's word in chapter 1, verse 8. That the gospel will ring forth from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria to the ends of the earth. The gospel went out with amazing power as Jesus promised. Samaria receiving the gospel with joy demonstrates that there are no boundaries for the gospel. You see, because the Samaritans were especially hated by the Jews who considered themselves God's special people. Yes, they were God's special people. They had the temple. They had God's word, the Torah. They had God's revelation. They were chosen by God. They had God's covenant and His promises, and they hated the Samaritans. Why? Well, their animosity went way back in history, back to the 9th century BC. Israel was at its peak. You know, it was the the, the greatest kingdom Um, under King Solomon. They were a dominant power. The nations around them brought them tribute. But according to the Jews, the Samaritans, the Samaritans were responsible for the end of all that glory. It was they who rebelled against King Solomon's son, Rehoboam, and started their own state. They created their own false religion, rivaling rivaling the temple in Jerusalem. And then they led 10 out of the 12 tribes astray to worship idols. And then when they were finally invaded and conquered, their conqueror's policy was assimilation into marriage mixing everyone together, creating, like letting them have this syncretistic re- religion. So to the Jews, the Samaritans were a mongrel nation of half-breeds who profaned the pure worship of Yahweh. I'll give you an example of this. The Jewish rabbis, right, there's a saying, and, and this is what it says, Let no man eat the bread of the Samaritans, for he who eats their bread is as he who eats swine's flesh. And then a popular prayer in those days said, And Lord, do not remember the Samaritans in the resurrection. You can be sure that the Samaritans felt the same about the Jews. There is this deep-seated animosity. And Simon, Simon the sorcerer in this passage, he is a prime example of a Samaritan. See, he practiced sorcery and people paid attention to him. He was proud. He led people astray, saying that he is the great power of God. And people were spellbound by him. They were captivated by him. No doubt did he have power and influence and control over these people as he held them in the palms of his hands in fear. But everything changed when Philip Proclaimed Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Look at verse 12. But when they believed Philip as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God and the, and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptized, and he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. 
See, they believed Philip's message about Jesus Christ. Men and women were now released from the bondage of sin. And even Simon himself believed. He knew and he witnessed the power of the Holy Spirit. He knew that it was real power, power that even his sorcery was no match for. And the Jews, remember, they hated, they hated the Samaritans. But because Jesus is risen, because he reigns over all peoples, his kingdom does not discriminate. It's the proclamation of the message that brings people to God, not the place like the temple. And that means that Christ has ushered in the fulfillment of the temple, a new way to get to God through faith in Jesus Christ by the power of the Spirit. There are now no more exclusion zones. There are no boundaries for the gospel of Jesus Christ as it breaks even old age-old boundaries of animosity. The question for us is, do we really believe that there are no boundaries for the gospel. You know, I ask some people um, whether they think that there is any place or group of people that the gospel seems impossible to penetrate. Right? Where, where is it that, that we think, like, humanly speaking, like the gospel cannot make an impact, cannot penetrate? Some of the answers I got, Antarctica. <laughs> I was like, Maybe the, pen- maybe the gospel is not for penguins. Um, Pakistan and other majority Muslim countries. Um, we thought about it, like maybe North Korea. Uh, someone said, my uni tutor, uh, who is staunchly and openly against Christianity. They, they would speak against Christians every time they get a chance to, at every opportunity. What about the LGBTQ, etc. lobby group? How about your home? See, God's word for us today is that there is nowhere, absolutely nowhere, where the gospel shouldn't be preached. There are no boundaries. It is relevant for all peoples because Jesus is the risen king of all things created. So you are not here by coincidence, even if you are not yet a believer of Jesus. See, the gospel, the message of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, crucified for the sins of many, raised from the dead, life giver of those who believe in Him, is for you too. Do you believe? Do you trust in His life-giving life. And if you, you know, if you want to think more about it, if you want to discuss this more, then please, please talk to someone here, talk to me. I would love to have a chat with you about this news if you're considering it. So there are no boundaries for the gospel of the risen king. Point two, there are no second class Christians. Have a look at verse 14. Verse 14, when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. When they arrived, they prayed for the new believers there that they might receive the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Do you see the significance of this? See, the Samaritans... They received the Holy Spirit. This is the same Spirit who came upon the apostles. And this means that they received God Himself, that He has taken up residence in their lives. You can't get any closer to God than this. The Samaritans who were once far off, idolaters, blasphemers of God, who couldn't get into the inner courts of the temple, are now full members of the body of Christ by the Spirit There are no second-class citizens in God's kingdom. And to underline that point, we see that the prerequisite of receiving the Spirit is belief. 
He is given freely to those who believe. You don't have to be influential. You don't have to be rich enough to, to buy uh, the, the gift of the Holy Spirit. You don't have to be smart. It is your response to the news that counts. There are no second-class citizens in God's kingdom. Now, this passage raises a question. What about the second baptism of the Spirit? You know, what happens here is that, you know, there are sub, the, the Samaritans, they, they believed, but when the apostles came, they realized, hey, they haven't received the Holy Spirit yet, so let's pray for them, and they received the Holy Spirit. And there's some Pentecostals and charismatic churches teach such a two-stage conversion uh, from passages like this. They say that, you know, there are regular Christians, and then there are, you know, the spiritual Christians those who are baptized or filled with the Spirit and who exhibit spiritual gifts. Uh, for example, some churches teach that you must be able to speak in tongues to prove that you have the Spirit in you. Now, what happens with this teaching, this kind of teaching, is that you end up with first and second class Christians, which is the exact opposite of what this passage is teaching us. There are no second class Christians. Everyone who believes receives the Spirit even the Samaritans of all people. God doesn't discriminate. So, the next question, the following question is, well, what do we make of the apostles imparting the Spirit? What do we make of, of this passage? So, this is where we need to, I guess, note the distinction between what is descriptive and what is prescriptive. Right, descriptive and prescriptive. The book of Acts is a historical narrative. It describes what happened. Now, what happened, what was described, doesn't necessarily equate to what we should make happen today. But at the same time, we need to also understand that you know, God has, has a purpose and a point to make that is prescriptive based on what is described. Now, I'll give you an example. If we read about the atrocities of war, right, we go back into the history books, we read the atrocities of war, the point isn't to then repeat the same atrocities, right? You don't do what is described. The point is to learn from it and not to repeat history, isn't it? So what is the point in Acts 8? What is the purpose? What is the author teaching us, are we supposed to repeat the second baptism of the Spirit or is it something else that we should take away with us? What is described in chapter 8 is new territory. The gospel is breaking new ground. So the apostles went to check things out. And that means this is a, a unique and unusual event. It is the first time this has happened. Before this, the gospel stayed in Jerusalem and was only proclaimed to Jews. You had to be Jew to be Christian. But now, Samaritans. And this is how, so that means this is not how things normally operate. See, the Bible teaches that those who believe receive the Holy Spirit. For example, Acts 2.38 says this, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then in chapter 10, the Holy Spirit came upon the people who heard the message and believed. And then Peter was like, well, we shouldn't withhold baptism from these people because clearly the Holy Spirit has come upon them. And Ephesians 1, 13 teaches that we receive the Spirit when we believe. Have a look at chapter Ephesians 1, 13. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in Him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. Now, given that background, I think the point in Acts chapter 8 is that there are no second-class Christians because the Samaritans were also worthy to receive the Holy Spirit because they believed the message proclaimed. They were full members of Christ, equal to the apostles. We receive the Holy Spirit when we repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't get any closer to God than that, than to have Him dwell in you. 
There are no second-class Christians. So what does that mean for us? Right, just because some people might serve more and others serve less, just because some people know more and others know less, it doesn't mean that you are more or less of a Christian. But I also need to note, however, that there are no stagnant Christians either. We are expected to grow in maturity. But there are no second-class Christians. We must not look down on our brother or sister in Christ just because they don't serve as much as you or just because they don't know as much doctrine as you. We do not look down upon them. Secondly, evangelism is a spiritual work not merely an intellectual work. And I love how uh, Henry reminded us of that in the, in the Bible reading, where he explained to us that we pray for God to open our hearts to receive His Word because of His illumination and His revelation to us. It is a spiritual work of God who reveals His will and His, his desire for His people in His Word. Evangelism is the same. It is a proclamation of the news of Jesus Christ. Because it is a spiritual work, it is not about how persuasive I am. It is not about whether I could answer all the questions that people have. Because it is the Spirit's work to change hearts as the Word of God is faithfully declared. That is evangelism. Not the capacity to win debates. Not the ability to answer everyone's every single question and doubts. But clarity in declaring Jesus, the risen King. And that changes our sense of failure and success in evangelism because it is now not about me. It is not about me and my abilities. It is about God's work in their lives. I am a mouthpiece for God, but as a mouthpiece, I must speak. And that means no one is beyond the possibility of salvation. So I won't shy away from preaching, even to the one who is staunchly against Christianity, even to the one who hates Jesus Christ. God has, has always and will continue to save souls through the prayers and the faithful proclamation of the gospel of His people. Now, I want to note that it doesn't mean that you know, we shouldn't consider how we go about it, you know, um, I received a letter. <laughs> I don't know if you've received a letter. Maybe if you live locally, you might have received the same letter. But I received a letter just last week, right? I should have kept it to read it here, but it only kind of came to me afterwards. I'm like, oh, man. But to give you an idea of what this letter said, it started off with talking about Nazis, right? It start, started off going, like, in bold, in red, Hitler and the Nazis, and then I skimmed it, and it's like, oh, they did this and that and this and that, all these atrocities and so on. And then somehow, it went from Hitler and Nazis to COVID and the vaccines. And I was like, where's this person going? And I'm like, oh, I don't know, man, it's pages and pages, and I started flipping. And then I see John 3.16. And I was like, what? <laughs> what are you doing? I was like... You might now, and he starts talking about how you must believe in Jesus. Jesus is the only way. He's the, he's the way, the truth, the life. You must trust in Jesus. And I was like, man, that is so unwise. What a bad name you were giving to Christians. To the point where Rebecca was like, do you think we need to talk to our neighbors to clarify that he's not from us? <laughs> and I was like, you probably should. But I don't know how to bring it up. But anyway, I brought it up and, and we're just like, yeah, I don't know. But it doesn't mean that we just go about doing things like that. We've got to, we still, we, you know, we've got to be wise like, like serpents, snakes, is it? Wise like snakes and innocent like doves. We, we all, it doesn't mean we just go about doing things in a silly way. But all, all need to hear the gospel. Finally, the fact that the Holy Spirit is a free gift for all who believe underscores the truth that there are no second-class Christians. Look at verse 18. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on, the, laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, Give me also this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Peter answered, May your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. 
You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord in the hope that He may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. The gift of the Holy Spirit is not just for the powerful. It is not only accessible for the rich. The Holy Spirit cannot be bought. He is freely given. Simon wanted this power to impart the Holy Spirit on others for himself, to use for his own gain. That is how he operated. That's what he knew. He's, he thought this is like a new sorcery that I could just purchase, like I buy um, you know, spell books and stuff like that. But Christ cannot be manipulated for your own desires. Jesus is king. And he demands our surrender. He is not there to serve your desires. He is not there to give you what you want or to, for your self-promotion, your comfort, or to make your life easier. So even though we might not have offered money, right, for spiritual power, any time we seek spiritual power or abilities in order to promote ourselves or to, we make the same error. Preaching to gain recognition or status falls into the same category of sin. Serving to advance ourselves in the church's, I guess, power structure is the same. Even seeking godliness so that others will notice falls into the same category of sin. Let me give you an example. It's about, it's like pointing out your humility. It's like, oh, look, Look at how humble I am. Well, you know, who, who do you think is humble in this, in this church? Me, yeah? Like, the fact, once you point out your humility, you will betray the fact that you take pride in apparently being humble. See, do you have the same attitude as Simon? Do you seek spiritual ability and power in order to promote yourself? Do you seek serving or knowledge so that you might be seen as someone who is knowledgeable or particularly great at serving. This is something we need to repent of. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much that you have raised Jesus Christ from the dead and he is indeed seated at your right hand reigning. And Father, because of that, we know that the gospel knows no boundaries. We've, we've experienced that ourselves as the gospel has been proclaimed to us, non-Jews, so that we might believe. And we thank you, Lord, that we also have received your Holy Spirit, that he dwells in us, so that there are no second-class Christians. We pray, Lord, that you might embolden us to boldly proclaim this news of Jesus Christ by the power of your Spirit and that we might be blessed to see you work in the lives of others, transforming them so that they might believe and also be included as full members of the body of Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.